Den lykke er jo lidt en anden type, end, end den der stikker, der bare snakker for at redde sin egen røv. Øh, når... Han er jo politistykker, og det er sådan lidt mere sofistikeret stikker. Det vil sige, at han begynder direkte at arbejde og samarbejde med politiet. Det er nok den værste type stikker, der findes. Det er fuldstikkeren. Den lykke became Hells Angels during the first Danish biker war, but feared for his life after crossing one of the most powerful members of H.A. Denmark and decided to go to the police. Instead of prosecuting him for being involved in a murder, weapons and other serious criminal activities, he was never charged and became the police's most valuable biker informant in Denmark's history. This was illegal in Denmark at the time, causing a great scandal not only for the police and the security police, but also for several high-ranking officials in the government. Den Lønge, han er en af de mange HA'er, som er blevet smidt ud i Brad Standing. Og han ender med at lave den ultimative dødsøg. Han bliver meddeler for politiet, og derfor så lever han den dag i dag i sky. He worked for the police as a Hells Angels member, but got kicked out in bad standing for so to change his colors and become bandidos while still working for the police. From hang around to prospect, from fully patched member to sergeant of arms and from biker to police informant, this is the story of Dan Lynch, Denmark's best or worst informer, depending on who you ask. Whether society wants to admit it or come to terms with it, There has to be stability in the underworld. Somebody's got to run it. And people have to come to terms with that fact. You know, they have this moral uh, dilemma. You know, they think that, you know, we're going to get rid of the, uh, this organization and everything's going to be uh, gone. The, the crime's going to be gone. The drugs are going to be gone. No. This is Biker History with Magnus. No, it's going to destabilize it and somebody else is going to go, hey, I could do that. And somebody else is going to go, well, yeah, but I could do it better than him. And what happens is you create a conflict. Dan Lynch's criminal career started early in his teens, but it first became real serious when he tried to sell a handgun and the deal turned sour when he was hit by the man he was selling it to. He shot the other man in the head, killing him. First, I feel like the flap goes down and then I see red. It happens when I'm threatened or beaten, then I will be completely defective in the head. I got six years. According to him, he was selling the gun to get out of the criminal world, but ended up doing the complete opposite. <laughs> my father rode a motorcycle and during my studies, I bought a BSA bike. Uh, but after three days, uh, I crashed and my friend in the backseat had his head completely smashed in. That start is very uh, indicative of the rest of my life. He served his time in prison and came out a more hardened criminal than before and became a member of a small local biker club in Copenhagen, the chosen few. His first encounter with the Hells Angels came when he saw some of them riding in Los Angeles. When I was sailing, I saw some Hells Angels in Los Angeles and thought, that's it. That's just me. In the beginning of the 80s, his club merged with three other small clubs and became filthy few and prospects of the first Hells Angels chapter in Denmark, which at this time is at war with the other leading biker club, Bullshit MC. Check out my video for more on that. In December 1985, Hells Angels is celebrating their fifth anniversary and as prospects. Filthy few is responsible for the security in and around the event. Den 21. december træder tre medlemmer ind på Nemoland. Det drejer sig om René Nødskov Ludvigsen, kaldet Ludvig, Ole Bonnesen, som blev kaldt Ost, og Dan Lønge, der er sin kammerat, der blev kaldt for den lille. They enter a small neighborhood, Christiania, where the rival club has their clubhouse. According to Lynch, they went there to listen for some gossip about bullshit, and if they were up to something. Så beslutter vi os faktisk for at gå ind og tage en bajer og en vand på Nemo. Og sidder derinde. Men hvorfor skulle de lige gå ind i Nemoland? Øh, og de, de bevæbnede. De bevæbnede vil ikke gå ind. De ved jo godt, når vi går ind på Christiania, så går vi ind på bullshit-området. Eller i hvert fald det, der er tilbage af bullshit-området. Og vi ved, at når vi sætter os dernede, så går der ikke ret lang tid. Så... Not long after they have entered a bullshit-controlled bar, several bullshit-members arrive, including the president Hofting. Jeg ser så pludselig en, der kommer ind i mit synsfelt 
og der dykker bartender ned under barn, og der reagerer jeg med det samme, og prøver at advare Ludvig. Og da jeg vender min opmærksomhed mod Ludvig, der ser jeg så, at ham, som er kommet ind der, han står med en pistol ned i hovedet på Ludvig. One bullshit member is critically wounded, along with a civilian, and the president of the club, Hovding, is killed. Jeg ser så Høvding ligge på gulvet, og det er først der, jeg ser det ham. Og jeg smutter så rundt om ham og kommer ud derfra, og det eneste, vi snakker om hele vejen ned til bilen, som stod ude i Prinsessegade, det var ligesom... Hvordan fanden overlevede vi det her? According to Dan Lynch, it was the bullshit members who first drew their guns. However, this is something that has had people questioning the honesty of Lynch since the few witnesses present. All said that black sheep were the only ones with guns, and there wasn't found any other shooting weapons at the crime scene. According to Lynch, this must be because they had time to remove the guns before the police came. Kigger man overordnet på det, så det er helt klart et signal fra Hells Angels om, nu kommer vi at hente jer derind. Both Ludwig and Ost gets life in prison, which was 16 years in Denmark at the time, though they both claimed they were never there, for then later to change their story and say it was in self-defense. But Dan Lynch was never arrested or wanted by the police. It was like he had never been there. The murder of the president of the rival club was the filthy few's ticket into Hell's Angels and Ludwig earned the patch filthy few, a sign that he has gone above and beyond for the benefit of the club, and they become the second Angels chapter in Scandinavia, Hell's Angels South in Roskilde. In 1988, the war with bullshit ends when they give up and disband their club, though several former bullshit members would later become banditos. Hell's Angels is now the biggest and only international biker club in Denmark and declares at a press conference that only clubs that work for them will be tolerated. There's a new sheriff in town. As the club expands in the Nordic countries, a power struggle within the club in Denmark is brewing. The beginning of Dan Lynch's downfall in the club came when he came into a dispute with the then powerful and strong character of the Hell's Angels, Jan Clark Jensen. Som jeg forstår det efter de oplysninger vi har fået, der er der ingen tvivl om at Clark, han er ligesom det medlem af Hell's Angels, der er mest opsat på at få startet en krig. Ja, men altså, jeg lagde mig ud med Clark, fordi at jeg ligesom uh, sagde min mening, ikke? og det, det har jeg sgu altid gjort i klubben. Uh, så blev Clark vildt sur over det. The dispute was about drugs, where Lynch says he doesn't have a problem with people using drugs for recreational purposes, but he was against it when they started to sell it in large quantum. And when one of the members is convicted of drug sale, it divided the club internally, and there became coldness between the two chapters. The center part here is that we are a biker club, not a drug club. South uh, wouldn't even accept that someone in our chapter had a prospects or hangarounds, uh, but the chapter in Titan Street did. This internal rift sent Dan Lynch out into the cold, and he consequently asked to be transferred to the chapter in Hamburg, something he was allowed to do, but soon regretted it. As a result of this, a few members from Hamburg went to Denmark, to find a solution to the problems between Dan Lynch and Jan Clark Jensen and called a meeting. But things didn't turn out in Dan Lynch's favor. Before the meeting, I was arrested in Dragger with a revolver and eight grams of cocaine. That's why I never showed up. But he, of course, knew who was behind it. It was Clark, and now the heat around him would be turned significantly up. Hans Engels trænger ind ude hos min kone, mens min søn er hjemme og og så får jeg at vide, at klubben havde været der og taget alle ting, og at jeg var smidt ud. Og så havde de været rundt hos rigtig mange mennesker. Med våben og true folk i omgangskredsen med ikke at have kontakt med mig. Og, og det vil sige, at man har ikke har haft nogen som helst problemer med at skulle gøre op med mig på private adresser. Clark was later himself kicked out in bad standing from the Angels, because he was against the peace agreement with banditos. 
A year later, he joined his former arch enemy bandidos. Hvis man tager en fyr som Clark, han var en af drivkræfterne til at starte den første krig. Og så bliver han smidt ud og ender over i bandidos, altså den klub, han var med til at starte en krig mod. Og så kan man sige, man kan også tage en fyr som Fejo, der er med til at kickstarte krigen med at være med til at foretage skuddrabet ud i lufthavnen. Det bliver han dømt for. I dag der er han medlem af Banditas, det vil sige, at han sidder til bords med sine gamle hovedfjender. Right after he made the top spot on Denmark's most wanted list in 2011, he disappeared and has never been found. Det er fuldstændig gennemgående, når man kigger på alle de her krig og konflikter, at når nogen bliver smidt ud fra den ene klub, så bliver de optaget hos en anden klub, som tidligere var deres hovedfjender. Og på den måde der kan man sige, at hele romantikken omkring broderskabet og loyaliteten, det falder til jorden, når krigen slutter. According to a Bandidos informant, Clark was killed by his new club in 2011, though he didn't know the reason why. His death and the disposal of the body was therefore a standing joke among the prospect members of the Bandidos house, which always started the same way. Where's Clark? Dan Lynch says that he never received an answer as to why he was kicked out, but says he has heard 15 different explanations from people who are not part of the club, but never from the club itself. Lynch was given the label bad standing, which has the consequence that you have to hand in the back tag and other biker symbols, but it also means that you now can be hunted freely. According to the newspaper Extra Bladet, over 100 Hells Angels members have been thrown into bad standing in Denmark since the club was founded in 1980. On average, there are two to three ejections every single year. The paper says that the same is true about bandidos, and that these banishments often has its roots in power struggles internally in the clubs, something that happened to a former bandidos after he was shot and lost one of his legs. They came while he was still in hospital and told him the news. Så jeg fik bare at vide, at jeg var ude af klubben, og fik begrundelsen, at jeg var ude, fordi jeg ikke havde skudsikker vest på, og det var, jeg skulle have haft skudsikker vest på på det tidspunkt, jeg blev skudt. The bad standing sticker you get is so important in the biker environment, that on one occasion, a deceased bandidos was dug up in the middle of the night at assistance cemetery in Copenhagen. The dead man's vest with the back tag and other biker symbols had been removed from the grave. The reason it had emerged that he had identified two members of Bandidos to the police as the perpetrators of the shooting of witnesses to a bank robbery. Lynch is now fair game and anybody killing him will get a huge status boost inside the club. He has to flee Denmark. While on the run, the Hells Angels sought out his closest family, including his in-laws and his then wife. The bikers stood guard in front of their residences, and they threw black crosses through the letterboxes. The harassment went on for ten months, but after Lynch learned that Hell's Angels were looking for the brother of a man who had, at some point, hidden him, he had come to a crossroad. Then I had enough. I went to the Swedish police who referred me to the biker group in Denmark. My plan was for the police to get me in exchange for protecting my family. H.A. practiced their preaching, and anybody not taking orders from them would be eliminated, and soon undertakers ended up in a violent conflict with the Angels. We were not like all other motorcycles in Denmark that would box under for HR, and we would not be like that. We were just 21 against all of Denmark. Because the people who would take contact with us would know that they would be smothered or smothered or smothered. To counter this, Undertakers reach out to Bandidos Europe in France and soon becomes the first Bandidos chapter in Denmark and the second in Europe. Lynch is quickly headhunted by the Bandidos as they know what has happened to his family, and he has experience with heavy weapons and explosives. Fordi at det var ikke nogen hemmelighed, at jeg var fucking pissed over det, der var sket med min familie. Bandidos vidste, at jeg havde haft meget med våben at gøre. Lynch gets the green light to become a member, at the same time as he is a police agent. He becomes Bandido's sergeant-at-arms and responsible for security for the club. He has a lot of knowledge of Hell's Angels and will now 
also get first-hand information about the Bandidos, and the police use their favorite name for an informant on him, the Golden Bird. But this will later become a major problem for both the police, the security police, and for the Minister of Justice, because what they are doing is not legal. The Great Nordic Biker War really exploded in 1995 at Kastrup Airport in Denmark, where Hells Angels and Bandidos members, by coincident, landed at the airport at the same time. The Angels discover their rivals and attack them from two sides, and one Bandidos is killed, while another runs into the crowded airport while being fired at. This was the first time that the war was fought in a crowded, public place, and this killing would spawn a massive retaliation from their main rival. Bandidos acquires two rocket launchers, weapons that are normally used against battle tanks in war. Lynch is asked to show how the two rocket launchers are fired, but he offers to trade them for some machine guns through his contacts instead, something they agree to. Jeg forklarer Tony helt exakt, hvem der er, der skal gøre det der derinde. Og fortæller ham, at der er ikke ret lang tid. Jeg fortæller ham, hvem jeg havde været sammen med. Og jeg var nedkær med at fortælle exakt, hvor vi havde mødtes med banditers medlemmer. Med, med, også med, hvem der havde været med, hvad der er blevet sagt. They hatch a plan to gather all the weapons and arrest Lynch with them. And in this way, get all of the weapons off the streets in one swoop. But the police strike prematurely... Lynch has not arrived with the rockets when they bust through the door, and they only manage to confiscate the machine guns. Lynch now has serious explanation problems on how this happened. One of these rockets is later fired at the Angels' Viking party, and ends with an HA member and a single mother being killed, as well as several injured. The Bandidos member that fires the rocket is Niels Paulson, who ironically had been a foster child of one of the policemen investigating the bikers. His DNA is found on a ski mask used to hide his face, along with a scar on his chin from the recoil when he fired the rocket. In the 90s, it was not legal to use civilian undercover agents in Denmark, but the police is so excited over their golden bird Dan Lynch that they continue working with him even though this is against the law. But when the word gets out that they have a civilian working illegally inside Bandidos, the police panics and Dan Lynch is fired as an agent. The issue with the confiscated weapons now emerges within Bandidos and Lynch knows he can't explain it in a believable way. When Bandidos realize that he is working for the police, Lynch has to go into hiding again. A long battle now begins for Lynch, who has been revealed as an informer both by the Angels and Bandidos, and the latter now post his address online for everyone to see. For six years, he desperately tries to get protection from the authorities, but because the police will not admit that they have broken the law, he gets no helping hand. Running out of options, Dan Lynch only see one solution left for him. Go public and tell what has happened, da vi begynder at bringe de her artikler i Ekstrabladet med Dan Lønges afsløringer, der bliver der lynhurtigt et politisk pres, så der breder sig meget hurtigt en stor skandale, og der bliver også nedsat en kommissionsundersøgelse. The scandal causes the Danish parliament to create the Dan Lynch Commission to find out what happened. The police panics and actually go out publicly and claim that Dan Lynch is a double agent who works for the bikers with police chief Jun Bro saying in an interview, Dan Lynch simply received an offer from the biker community that he could not refuse. They told him to go to the press and say that he really worked for the bikers and undermine his credibility as a reliable witness against the biker clubs. The police chief saying that Hell's Angels and Bandidos had offered to leave Lynch in peace if he did this, which doesn't seem like a very plausible explanation. But the scandal was Dan Lynch's ticket out. He was enrolled in the witness protection program and has since 2002 lived at a secret address in Sweden. He also has had plastic surgery to try to avoid being recognized. When later interviewed by the press and asked why he went public, he said, I owe it to the people who lost their lives during the biker war, not least the 29-year-old woman who died during the rocket attack in Titan Street but also the elderly woman who was killed by a car bomb in Norway. They were innocent, and the deaths could have been avoided if the police had acted on my warning. In 2003, 
The Dan Lynch Commission started its work and at the center of attention was, of course, Lynch himself. However, when he was questioned by the commission, he had trouble remembering several things something many found conspicuous and was something that undermined his credibility. In September 2006, Dan Lynch Commission publishes its report. The police are criticized for their collaboration with ex-biker Dan Lynch, but no one can be held responsible for management failure, reads the conclusion. A month later, Dan Lynch criticizes the police and the media, saying he has never received the protection he was promised during his cooperation with the police. My life has been destroyed, my family, and I have no normal life. I am armed around the clock and must constantly look over my shoulder. It will happen to me too, just like it's happened to all the others who have been in this situation. You die. It is not something the police decide. It's Hells Angels banditos who decide when it happens. I'm not that hard to find. How many people who ended up in jail because of Dan Lynch is unknown since the police refuses to admit what he has done and the consequences of him working with them. But there is no doubt that he is the most damaging informant to both Hell's Angels and Bandidos in Denmark's history. At the time of making this video, he is waiting for his third facial operation. This is the newest public picture of him. Remember to hit that subscribe button for more biker history, and please check out my other videos to see if there are other topics you find interesting. And I hope to see you in the next one.